Mark 2, 1 to 12. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. This passage shows us our Lord once more at Capernaum. Once more we find him doing his accustomed work, preaching the word, and healing those that were sick. We see in these verses what great spiritual privileges some persons enjoy and yet make no use of them. This is a truth which is strikingly illustrated by the history of Capernaum. No city in Palestine appears to have enjoyed so much of our Lord's presence during his earthly ministry as did this city. It was the place where he dwelt after he left Nazareth, Matthew 4.13. It was the place where many of his miracles were worked and many of his sermons delivered. But nothing that Jesus said or did seems to have had any effect on the hearts of the inhabitants. They crowded to hear him, as we read in this passage, till there was no room about the door. They were amazed, they were astonished, they were filled with wonder at his mighty works, but they were not converted. They lived in the full noontide blaze of the sun of righteousness, and yet their hearts remained hard, and they drew from our Lord the heaviest condemnation that he ever pronounced against any place except Jerusalem. Thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. 
But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Matthew eleven twenty three and 24 It is good for us all to mark well this case of Capernaum. We are all too apt to suppose that it needs nothing but a powerful preaching of the gospel to convert people's souls, and that if the gospel is only brought into a place, everybody must believe. We forget the amazing power of unbelief and the depth of man's enmity against God. We forget that the Caponeites heard the most faultless preaching and saw it confirmed by the most surprising miracles and yet remained dead in trespasses and sins. We need reminding that the same gospel, which is the savor of life to some, is the savor of death to others, and that the same fire which softens the wax will also harden the clay. Nothing, in fact, seems to harden man's heart so much as to hear the gospel regularly and yet deliberately prefer the service of sin and the world. Never was there a people so highly favored as the people of Capernaum, and never was there a people who appeared to have become so hard. Let us beware of walking in their steps. We ought often to use the prayer of the litany, from hardness of heart, good Lord, deliver us. We see in the second place from these verses how great a blessing affliction may prove to a man's soul. We are told that one sick of the palsy was brought to our Lord at Capernaum in order to be healed. Helpless and impotent, he was carried in his bed by four kind friends and let down into the midst of the place where Jesus was preaching. At once the object of the man's desire was gained. The great physician of soul and body saw him and gave him speedy relief. He restored him to health and strength. He granted him the far greater blessing of forgiveness of sins. In short, the man who had been carried from his house that morning, weak, dependent, and bowed down both in body and soul, returned to his own house rejoicing. Who can doubt that to the end of his days this man would thank God for this palsy? Without it, he might probably have lived and died in ignorance, and never seen Christ at all. Without it, he might have kept his sheep on the green hills of Galilee all his life long, and never been brought to Christ, and never heard these blessed words, Thy sins be forgiven thee. That palsy was indeed a blessing. Who can tell, but it was the beginning of eternal life to his soul? How many in every age can testify that this palsied man's experience has been their own? They have learned wisdom by affliction. Bereavements have proved mercies. Losses have proved real gains. Sicknesses have led them to the great physician of souls, sent them to the Bible, shut out the world, shown them their own foolishness, taught them to pray. Thousands can say like David, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. 
Psalm 11971. Let us beware of murmuring under affliction. We may be sure there is a needs be for every cross and a wise reason for every trial. Every sickness and sorrow is a gracious message from God and is meant to call us nearer to Him. Let us pray that we may learn the lesson that each affliction is appointed to convey. Let us see that we refuse not him that speaketh. We see in the last place in these verses the priestly power of forgiving sins, which is possessed by our Lord Jesus Christ. We read that our Lord said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He said these words with a meaning. He knew the hearts of the scribes by whom he was surrounded. He intended to show them that he laid claim to be the true high priest and to have the power of absolving sinners, though at present the claim was seldom put forward but that he had the power, he told them expressly. He says, The Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. In saying, Thy sins be forgiven thee, he had only exercised his rightful office. Let us consider how great must be the authority of him who has the power to forgive sins. This is the thing that none can do but God. No angel in heaven, no man upon earth, no church in council, no minister of any denomination can take away from the sinner's conscience the load of guilt and give him peace with God. They may point to the fountain open for all sin, they may declare with authority whose sins God is willing to forgive. But they cannot absolve by their own authority. They cannot put away transgressions. This is the peculiar prerogative of God and a prerogative which he has put in the hands of his Son, Jesus Christ. Let us think for a moment how great a blessing it is that Jesus is our great high priest and that we know where to go for absolution. We must have a priest and a sacrifice between ourselves and God. Conscience demands an atonement for our many sins. God's holiness makes it absolutely needful. Without an atoning priest, there can be no peace of soul. Jesus Christ is the very priest that we need, mighty to forgive and pardon, tender-hearted and willing to save. And now, let us ask ourselves whether we have yet known the Lord Jesus as our high priest. Have we applied to him? Have we sought absolution? If not, we are yet in our sins. May we never rest till the Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we have sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his voice saying, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee.